so hi everyone. Thank you all so much for, for joining us today for our webinar on Moneyball, how the Texas Rangers use low-code data engineering and analytics to identify MVPs. My name is Ashley Blaylock. I am your host and moderator for today's session. I'm the Director of Demand Generation here at Prophecy, uh, and again, we're so excited to have you all here. I'd like to go ahead and introduce our speakers for today's session. First up, we have Alexander Booth who is the Assistant Director of Research and Development of Baseball Operations at the Texas Rangers. Alexander is entering his sixth season with the club and in his current role is working to revolutionize his data teams with a modernized data strategy. In prior roles, Alexander has specialized in machine learning, engineering, and cloud development for data science. Alexander holds a master's degree in data science from Northwestern University and is also a proud graduate of Washington University in St. Louis. We're really excited to have him here. Uh, we're equally excited to have Franco Patano, who is a lead product specialist at Databricks, where he brings over 12 years of industry experience in data engineering and analytics. He has architected, managed, and analyzed data applications utilizing SQL, Python, Scala, Java, and Apache Spark, as well as experimenting with data science. Next, we have Mei Long, who is the product manager at Prophecy. She is on a mission to make data accessible, usable, and manageable in the cloud. Previously, May has uh, instrumented roles working with teams that have contributed to Apache Hadoop, Spark, Zeppelin, Kafka, and Kubernetes projects. We're really excited to have all of these speakers here, uh, so go ahead and join me in welcoming them. And without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and hand it off to Alexander uh, to kick us off. Awesome. Good morning, everyone. Happy to be here. Um, as they always say, I know how to make a machine learning model, but no idea how to share screens in Zoom. So let's see if I can get this working. Let's go there. Let's go here. Ready. Moneyball, how the Texas Rangers use low-code data engineering and analytics to identify MVPs. I love it. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Again, I'm Alexander Booth, uh, Assistant Director of R&D with the Texas Rangers. Um, it's an exciting season for us. Uh, it's an exciting season in baseball. There's a lot of revolutionary stuff happening in baseball this year with rule changes and increased pace of play and the Texas Rangers being uh, good at baseball again. You never know. Uh, so anyway, I am here to talk to you guys about kind of big data in baseball and kind of it's Comp comparisons and differences with kind of the rest of the industry. Um, before the Rangers, I did work in industry, so I have seen some of these problems before. Uh, so being able to kind of understand how Databricks, Prophecy, and kind of modern data strategies can help us uh, get that new and competitive advantage on the field by being one of the first clubs to being able to analyze data or being able to uh, process data is going to be important to the team. Um, so yeah, a couple of big problems that the Rangers experienced over the last few years. Uh, big data, big problems. There's been an explosion of new data sources in, since 2020 um, in our industry. And we'll go into a couple of what those are, because again, I'm not expecting you all to necessarily have a huge background in baseball. Uh, these new data sources require big data transformation. And we are kind of a small shop. We're kind of almost like a tech startup inside of the Texas Rangers. So we have a very small engineering team, a lean engineering team, and a very limited knowledge of Spark. Uh, contrast that also with another problem that, again, is pretty uh, standard in industry. Uh, baseball is a team sport, so that shouldn't mean that our data teams would have some kind of centralized uh, communication with each other. And unfortunately, our siloed data teams resulted in scattered data products. Nobody knew kind of where certain model outputs were. Nobody knew where kind of different KPIs existed. We had too many databases, we had too many people kind of altering those databases. And when you also have siloed data teams like this, uh, one other big problem that comes around is turnover. So let's say some people leave a data team and they don't document what they've done. This can result in duplicative work being created and this can also work um, allow for lost work. We've lost KPIs and models after we've had some turnover. Uh, so this decentralized governance resulted in a lack of standardization, some models uh, took in some like already kind of uh, one hot encoded output. Some models did not. Uh, no, no uh, centralized communication, no documentation. Um, so one thing that I really wanted to change about all of this is to increase monitoring and code reviews around our ML and analytical pipelines. So we'll cover both of these um, big data as well as kind of these siloed data teams as a problem. 
Uh, we'll start with data. Uh, this is all the, the fun stuff, right? I mean, what data is actually generated in baseball? Uh, so Moneyball is kind of the big keyword, and it's actually permeated into the data industry now as kind of that catalyst for making data-driven decisions. So your two-second recap, Moneyball, Billy Beam, Oakland A's. Oakland A's are a small market team. They don't make a lot of money. Um, so to kind of get a competitive advantage, they needed to understand market inefficiencies, and they identified that via data. And it kind of revolutionized this whole idea of getting a competitive advantage through data-driven decisions. Uh, so 2006 is when kind of new data started appearing in baseball. Prior to 2006, all data that was recorded was pretty tabular. So this meant things like home run counts, RBI counts, hit counts. And you can do all that in a, in a spreadsheet, essentially, right? Uh, you just toggle it all up and then do some averages, make a little pivot table, call it, a, call it an analysis. But starting in 2006, we started using PitchFX, which was a ball tracking system that allowed to capture spin rates of the baseball, as well as the velocity and movement of pitches. And this led to kind of the, the revolution in 2015 with the debut of StatCast. Um, if you ever watched an MLB broadcast, you'll likely hear the word StatCast dropped multiple times now. Uh, StatCast is a radar and HD video system that measures all action on the field for every single pitch. So not only are we are tracking spin rates, velocity, movement, but we're also tracking things like player position. We're tracking every step that anyone on the baseball field makes throughout the entire game. Um, and now this also has led into, as we'll get to in 2021, the more advanced tracking systems there as well. So next couple of years, they just uh, they flip flop from their providers. So we went to TrackMan, which also is in golf. And then we switched to Hawkeye, which is also in tennis. If you've ever seen the, the line kind of reviews in tennis, that's tracked using Hawkeye technology. Um, so this kind of switch to Hawkeye has allowed us to increase the amount of technology track. Uh, this includes things like pose tracking and field vision. Uh, so we're able to now track skeletons of the body. We're able to track things like your elbow, head, shoulders, knees, and toes. And I got a couple of slides there where you can actually see that in action. Uh, this has led to a new field in baseball called biomechanics, where we can uh, strap people in and kind of look at their skeletons and movement and understand if there's any efficiencies in how their bodies move. And that, of course, can lead to things like injury prevention or understanding fatigue, et cetera. Um, and then the last kind of note that I wanted to put here, typically when people think of Major League Baseball, you go, oh, it's only 30 baseball teams. How much data could that actually be? Uh, but baseball is way beyond Major League Baseball. Uh, so first I'll touch on the minor leagues here. So to get into Major League Baseball, a prospect typically has to rise through the ranks, going through levels such as single A, double A, triple A, before finally making it to the show. Uh, we want to be able to understand those minor leaguers. Those are the future of the game. We had a couple big prospects debut for the Orioles this year. We had Gunnar Henderson and Grayson Rodriguez pitch against us yesterday. So we want to understand how these players perform at a minor league level to be able to understand how to be effective against them at the major leagues. And so StatCast is now moving its way through the minor leagues as well. So now we're going to be tracking these skeletons at every game in AAA as well as the major leagues. So just a couple of uh, diagrams here. So every baseball game you go to, even if you don't know it, if you look around, you may actually see some of these cameras. Uh, they're all installed around the top of the stadium. Um, on the right, you can see that it's kind of like this big black box. Uh, there's at least 12 cameras installed at every stadium, and some teams have opted in to install more. Again, these are tracking the action at up to 300 frames per second, which we then need to analyze to be able to understand things like player movements and biomechanics in motion. Uh, biomechanics, so I, I love this stuff. I think the skeleton tracking is amazing and is kind of a revolution in the game. Um, they've also now rolled out skeleton pose tracking in other sports uh, like uh, American football and basketball, right? Uh, so with skeleton tracking at the major league level, we're able to understand exactly how a pitcher moves when he throws the ball. We're also able to exactly understand how a batter swings. Uh, I played little league growing up. I also played some in high school as well. You know, not that's not good enough at all to be uh, on the field. Uh, but one of the things I remember all the coaches saying is uh, to open up your hips more and take a longer stride length and bend your knees as you're kind of ready to catch the ball, right? We're now able to quantify that. I can tell you exactly how open your hips are, how long your stride is, how big your knee bend is as you're waiting to field the ball. And that is a revolution in the game in of itself. But of course, 
this data is only good enough if we can analyze it, which will lead us to our big problem. A couple more crazy data sources in baseball that, again, not a lot of people may recognize. Uh, so spin, how a baseball moves throughout the air. Uh, before, we track man and pitch effects had more of an inferred model for this. But now, because of these high-speed cameras, we can now observe the spin of the baseball. So Jacob deGrom throwing a 100-mile-an-hour fastball. We can actually tell you exactly how the baseball spins in flight, as well as exactly how it moves in an observed way. We can also see exactly how the ball is moving off of his fingers, where on the seams he's holding the ball. And again, this is huge data at a very high frame rate, which leads to problems with processing. And this is new for 2023. Uh, the big one that Major League Baseball has announced is this new concept of weather tracking. And we'll get into the LiDAR scans in a second, too. Uh, the idea here is that if we're tracking the weather at every stadium at, uh, I think it's around five, uh, every five seconds, uh, we can understand things like how much temperature and wind cause um, effects on the field to occur, right? So, for example, we all know that if I hit a home run into the wind uh, or a fly ball into the wind, uh, the drag of that and the wind pushing back will likely lead that to a fly out and not a home run. But if the wind is at the back of the ball and the wind is pushing the ball, then typically that'll become a home run. So that's independent of player talents, right? If we took a player that was lucky in their home runs because they always hit it into the wind, and at the Texas Rangers, we have an indoor kind of dome stadium. If we stick them in Arlington, are they going to still be as effective when there is not necessarily that much wind pushing the balls out into right field? Uh, the other big concept here, too, is LIDAR scans. So baseball is unique amongst almost all sports in that the stadiums in which the game is played are not uniform. Every stadium is unique, uh, and that causes its own kind of dynamic and, how, and strategy in how baseball is played at these stadiums. And also, teams change their, their stadium dimensions every season. For example, going into this season, both the Tigers and the Blue Jays have changed their outfield dimensions. And that, of course, plays differently. There could be more home runs. There could be more doubles and triples. The run environment, so that we'll call this, has changed. Um, a big example of this, too, happened in 2021, I think, when in the offseason there, the, Blue, uh, the Orioles um, actually um, moved back their left field fence. And they used to have a bunch of hitters that were really good at hitting home runs to left field. You move the fence back, it's now harder to hit home runs. And all of a sudden, Camden Yards went from being almost like a hitter's park with lots of home runs to left field to more of a pitcher's park and how that plays. And of course, this affects player performance and uh, identifying MVPs to bring it back to the title of the talk. So here's a smattering of various technologies. And again, one of the big problems is that more and more of these technology companies and startups are coming to fruition every year. And they're all trying to sell us their products. They're all trying to expand their tracking systems. Uh, one thing I also haven't really touched on is amateur and international. Uh, we now have data from a bunch of colleges and high schools. The World Baseball Classic happened recently as well, which is amazing. Uh, we now get data from Japan, Korea, the Czech Republic, Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico. How do we kind of now quantify and aggregate this large data at scale across all of these different vendors? Uh, and I really quickly like this slide as well. Um, again, not a lot of people may understand exactly how baseball operations data teams are broken down. Um, while we could have something like accounting, and finance, and uh, HR, which we do, of course, at the larger scale. In my specific role in baseball operations, our data teams are spread out in these more specific areas in terms of baseball. Uh, so I just touched on amateur analytics. So we have a whole staff devoted to analyzing the amateur game. And of course, this preps us for the draft. Advanced scouting, we have analysts devoted to the major league level. How do we advance scout the team that we're playing tonight? We're playing the Cubs this weekend. So how are we going to get the competitive edge against the Cubs at Wrigley? Um, how are we going to define our in-game strategy? Player development optimizes our minor league player performance. How can we make sure that we're getting the most out of our prospects, giving them the best chance possible to make the major league? Uh, pro analytics is more around the trade deadline, kind of what is happening at the pro level to kind of maybe infer things on player development and advanced scouting. Uh, there's always a couple of players that are huge surprises, and we need to be able to understand exactly what they're doing to be effective, even if they belong to other clubs. 
And of course, international athletics, which happened a lot with the World Baseball Classic. How can we find uh, these international players that may revolutionize the game if we're able to bring them into our team? Uh, and this is all kind of supplemented with baseball systems, our data analytics, our application, data engineering. How do we provide the data effectively for these teams? And then the new, more new teams, sports science, which is training the conditioning, biomechanics, uh, reaction times, all that good stuff as well. Uh, so we now cover the problem. We have these large, large amount of data. We have these silo data teams. We have these, this lean technology team as well that has to support all of it. So how do we kind of build a modern data strategy off of this? Uh, so a couple of our core kind of ideologies that we want to roll out. So you want to migrate from a legacy two-tier warehouse system to a modernized data lake house. And we'll get to kind of a data, it's more of a data mesh uh, situation as well on a Databricks. We wanna create the self-serve data mesh for transparent data availability. And we wanna federate governance while still keeping responsibility at the edge. So I want my data producers to still be able to create their pipelines, create their analyses, but have a little bit of federation to that. And that means that there'll be some more centralized requirements to keep the data products to maintain integrity, to make sure we're all working kind of on the same location. Uh, we all want to be able to manage and monitor and see exactly what everyone is doing. That communication across teams could provide a competitive advantage. So a couple of core data tenants that I threw out there. Uh, we want to build an analytical ecosystem that scales as new data sources are brought to market. We want to provide choice in analytical technologies. I want my analysts to be able to use R, Python, SQL, AutoML, Tableau, Power BI, whatever they want to be able to solve their problems that they're currently working in. Uh, we want to allow for autonomy and agility across my disparate data teams while avoiding bottlenecks with bringing productionalized data products um, across kind of our highly distributed team. Um, again, our minor league teams, too, are also situated in North Carolina and Arizona, right? So I have members of my team across the entire country, and I need all of them to be able to work together to produce these bottle, these data products at speed that are still in a productionalized sense and can be monitored by the overall kind of data ecosystem. And of course, I also want to encourage communication and collaboration. Uh, just like in the game of baseball, we only succeed as a team. And kind of a little equation here, come on, we're all analysts. Uh, mindset plus people plus process times technology. We have to have a good mindset. We have to have a collaborative mindset, that innovative mindset to change. We have to have strong people with strong talents and data science skills. We have to have good processes in place. And then the only way that can actually succeed at scale is through the right technology, which is where we'll get into with prophecy and Databricks. Um, We'll kind of go a little bit quick on these, this stuff. Um, this again is a classical problem that a lot of modern data teams are running into even outside of baseball. This is the limitation of just having a two tier architecture of a data lake and a data warehouse as separate entities. Um, increased maintenance efforts, since compute and storage are not separated, it's very, very expensive and you're not gonna be able to scale as effectively given those cost constraints. Uh, sometimes you're locked into proprietary data formats and proprietary data transformations, these licensed softwares. And that's really not great to perform large analytical queries to and make those reproducible uh, and difficult, difficulty adapting for a large variety of data sources. Uh, not only are we getting text data, video data, but now we're getting so many of these streaming data sources, IoT sensors, um, as well as, of course, the classical CSVs, JSONs, Parquets, et cetera, as well. The lack of data transparency across our warehouse has become a bottleneck for the development cycle of our analytical models. Uh, we don't know where data is. Sometimes the data is not clean enough. Sometimes the data is not processed enough. And we're not lean and agile enough to be able to create those changes at speed to allow for our analysts to create new data products quickly. Uh, so it's kind of, again, what we're trying to get to a modern data community. I've mentioned these terms before, data producers and data consumers. Um, and most of the time, your data consumers are also data producers. How can we get everyone to kind of work together in this holistic kind of lake house approach? Um, so my, our idea here is to kind of build this almost data mesh where our sub teams, our amateur analytics, our pro analytics, international analytics, our minor league analytics, they can all manage their own data sources. They can all manage the models off of those data sources individually. Um, that responsibility being pushed to the edge 
However, there's still that centrality of all of it existing in the same kind of workspace, the same lake house underpinning the entire kind of data uh, modality. And that is something that we really think can optimize the velocity of kind of our analytics output. Uh, so again, obstacles, small shop, lean engineering team, nobody knows how to do anything with Spark, divided data teams all over the place. And these legacy systems, we got to keep these warehouses, these on-prem systems working while we migrate to a modern data strategy. And so where does this, where does Propsy come in? I should probably mention Propsy and Databricks. Uh, we have some awesome people on the call with me here from both of these technology services. Uh, so we decided to move to Databricks as kind of our lake house solution, this new modernized lake house approach versus the two tier kind of uh, data lake and data warehouse solution. Uh, kind of the problem though with using Databricks is you have to write code yourself, right? And if I wanna do big data transformations, Spark is the gold standard to do that at scale across large clusters of compute. And while Databricks allows for that compute to be built and maintained, we don't have to worry about the infrastructure. We still have to write the code ourselves. And so if you ever try to hire a Spark developer, you may also know that those are kind of hard to come by, especially for uh, baseball prices. Uh, so how can we kind of either upscale our team or hire externally? Both of those did not seem to provide a quick enough solution for what we wanted to do to be able to kind of do these large big data transformations. So Prophecy is what is our technology solution that we identified as a almost like a user interface into data transformations on Databricks. No upskilling is needed to perform these big data transformations. We simply connect to our cluster on data, Databricks, drag and drop these transformational gems to create a Spark pipeline. We're able to create custom and reusable transformations across our domain. So someone on our amateur analytics team can create a custom transformation, uh, maybe something as simple as flattening a JSON blob in a more kind of a um, specific way. And we can reuse that transformation across a player development pipeline, for instance. And now both data engineers and analytical engineers, as our data analysts are also kind of engineering their own pipelines, everyone is able to make production pipelines with little to no spark knowledge which is really important to us again we wanted to keep that responsibility at the edge if someone on the player development team wants to create a data engineering pipeline i want to support that but i want that pipeline to be in turn kind of deployed into a centralized ecosystem where we all have visibility into what it's doing and prophecy provides a solution for that um, we are all connected to github through prophecy Every pipeline that we create, even with a drag and drop interface, it generates code behind the scenes and it generates PySpark code, it generates Scala code, and all of that is committed directly to GitHub. Uh, further, you can toggle between the gem view as well as the code view. And that's huge for us. We wanna be able to really kind of understand what Spark transformations are happening, especially as we're still all upskilling in our Spark background. There's no license or black box proprietary pipelines or connections. Everything's well, not exactly open source. Everything is committed to GitHub and it's transparent in the code that's actually generated. Uh, this allows for ease of integration with CI CD platforms, as well as for quality assurance testing, right? It provides that extra layer of quality assurance to make sure that a pipeline created at the edge is productionalized effectively. And further, everything is clear with the orchestration, with the lineage. And as we'll get into, it also integrates well with other open source tools. We've also used Airflow as a orchestration tool, which works well with both Prophecy and Databricks. Uh, so just some quick numbers here and the immediate impact that we've seen. Uh, three times more analysts and developers are able to create production ready pipelines. Um, it's not just my lean engineering team that has to be responsible for creating all of the data flows. Um, our analysts are now able to create effective data flows as well in a sustainable, reliable, extensible, productionalized way. Uh, seven times velocity in producing pipelines. Uh, from over a week per pipeline developer, now we can roll out a, uh, a rough pipeline in less than a day, which is awesome. And this includes, a, this obviously creates a huge value and speed to stakeholders. Instead of having to wait, you know, your two week sprints over, now we have to, now we can roll out our change every 10 days. Uh, with continuous integration, we're able to roll out these new pipelines immediately, which means you're able to roll out new analytical metrics, new KPIs that we're analyzing very quickly into our lake house, and then visualize that via reports to our stakeholders um, as 
<laughs> and it all just works, which is awesome. I love when things just work and I don't have to worry about it. Uh, so like I said, this ease of integration with Databricks and Apache Airflow, Apache Spark, these open source technologies to allow for transparent data pipelines and monitoring has been huge for us. Uh, we've been able to grow our fledgling data mesh by millions of records, backfilling historical seasons, and already kind of ingesting the thousands of pitches that have been thrown in 2023. We're fostering a centralized location where we can communicate as a team about pipelines, that centralized workspace on Databricks, that centralized workspace on prophecy, while maintaining responsibility of creation to the data producers that work on the edge. And finally, we're going to put our data in the hands of consumers more reliably and efficiently than ever before. And of course, by putting data in the hands of consumers immediately after a game, uh, we're able to quickly make changes. We're able to be agile in our data strategies. We're also able to be effective in understanding what players are kind of changing their game right now. What players should we target for acquisition? Who is kind of the players you should focus on in player development in the minor leagues? And of course, this allows us to generate uh, MVPs more effectively and hopefully build a sustainable quality data ecosystem for our next uh, competitive window, which is open right now, Jacob deGrom. Uh, of course, I'd be remiss uh, to, to not go through this whole talk and not mention machine learning or kind of how AI is kind of implementing baseball as well. So we're gonna tack this little slide here on at the end. And again, this also goes in hand, hand in hand with Prophecy and Databricks. You want to have a centralized machine learning registry where we can check out kind of which models have been created and for what reasons. We can have this uh, dynamic machine learning operations, and all of that data flow can be uh, usually created via the Prophecy GUI. Uh, so this quick graph, uh, this is a hit probability chart. So this is just a classification model that predicts the probability of a batted ball dropping for a hit. And it has some features in it, but here are some of the main ones, launch angle and launch speed. This is the angle off the bat that the ball is hit and how hard the ball was hit. So there's two main areas of red. Red is good, red means it's likely a hit. Uh, we have the big blob at the right, and those are actually going to be home runs. You hit the ball 100 miles an hour, you hit it at 25 degrees, it'll leave the ballpark no matter where you are. But then we have this kind of interesting, almost like a swoosh in the middle. Uh, between 60 miles an hour and 100 miles an hour. If you hit the ball, no matter how hard, between around 20 to 35 degrees, it'll likely go over the infielders, but land in front of the outfielders. And that, of course, will likely become a hit. And that'll be an increase in your on-base percentage. And this has, been, this has led to what's been called the launch angle revolution in baseball, where this is even being taught to kids in Little League now. You want to lift the ball in the air, if you can lift the ball, no matter how hard you hit it, if you lift the ball between the sweet spot, it'll likely drop for a hit. And just to tie it all back together to Moneyball and Billy Bean, if you get on base, we win. And one way to get on base is to hit this ball at the sweet spot. And now we have an AI-driven model that has led to a new result on the field that still leads to more runs and hopefully to more uh, wins for the team. Um, I think I've already gone way over my schedule time, so I think we'll kind of uh, kind of stop here. But uh, thanks for letting me uh, talk to you guys for, about baseball. And I think we're going to go into a, uh, a little roundtable discussion now as well. So excited to kind of hear what questions you all have for me uh, in addition to everything else. Thank you. Cool. Awesome. Thank you, Alexander. Uh, so that was awesome. We have a great questions, a huge list of great questions. So maybe we'll have a couple of them here. Um, the number one question I think a lot of folks have in mind is uh, how are the coaches and the players are consuming that data um, or the reports that you're generating and what's, um, what's the dynamic there? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I've, been, I've been using kind of the more like buzzwordy term of like data consumers and and baseball, who are the data consumers? The data consumers are the coaches and players kind of on the field, which is awesome. Uh, so a couple of quick examples. So before a game, we want to know kind of how a pitcher may be trying to get our batter out. Every single pitch in baseball is almost like a chess game. It's almost like a chess move. Um, you want to be strategic in where you're throwing pitches. You want to be strategic in whether or not you swing at a ball. Uh, so during games and really after games and before games, we generate post-game reports. We want our players to understand whether or not they were lucky or unlucky. Uh, you always see in baseball, oh, this guy made an amazing home run robbery catch and pulled it back, right? So that's quantified as an out. But is it really an out or did the player just get lucky making that catch? 
So by being able to communicate and tell our hitter, hey, man, and nine times out of 10, that's a home run. You just got robbed. It kind of puts them back into a good mental state that what they're doing at the plate is still good. But sometimes we notice things wrong. We notice that, oh, hey, man, uh, this pitcher, he's throwing you a lot of fastballs kind of up and in, and you're just taking them, right? Those are all going always going to be counted as strikes, especially with this umpire. So maybe we should kind of change our strategy going into the game tomorrow. Baseball is a long sport. Baseball is a marathon, 162 games over six months. So being able to quickly um, adapt and change our strategy immediately after a game going into the next one provides that competitive advantage for the players to be effective on the field. Got it, got it. That makes a lot of sense. And what I, it really um, resonated with me is when these folks work with the data engineers and the analysts and the um, machine learning folks to work together to, uh, to um, provide all of the insights and, and strategies. So one of the things I always kind of wonder is because um, we all often see in our data field, um, there's a disconnect between the, the analysts, the users, and the engineers, et cetera. So do you feel like this low code approach kind of puts you in a place so where all of the folks can work together very, very easily and onboard these data products more easily? Yeah, definitely. One thing that we've uh, used to do back before we kind of adapted to this modern data strategy, which again, I feel like a lot of other companies and every other industry is experiencing too. You kind of almost have like an engineering team, you have your kind of analytics team, and if the analysts need some data, they have to ask the data team, the engineering team to be able to transform it and provide it and load it before they can do any work. And sometimes that requires a two week sprint and maybe kind of it falls to the bottom of the priority list. And especially with my team, where we've been running a lean engineering team for a long time, there wasn't necessarily that rapid velocity in generating those transformations. And so again, just by, by putting this responsibility to the edge where these analysts can now also do some of the engineering work themselves, as long as it's moderated and centralized into this larger lake house ecosystem, uh, they're able to create that. And again, one of the limitations was that lack of uh, spark knowledge, that lack of kind of effective and reproducible pipeline. So being able to use a low code approach to do that in a centralized workspace really allowed for our analysts to create these production ready pipelines with just a minimal code review by our engineering team. And this of course has led to a lot of parallel development to get a lot more of these data sources and transformations in front of our uh, executives, in front of our players and coaches at a much faster rate. Awesome, yeah, that's good to know. So um, Franco, do you have any uh, questions for Alexander? Absolutely. Uh, I've been watching these questions come in and obviously I had questions for you as well, but uh, so one thing that I think is, is everyone's asking is like, we talked about this with fantasy sports data, a lot of people use data to make their decisions all the time. Uh, what are, uh, how do you have any plans to make this data, any data, uh, externally available? Cause I imagine some people, uh, might, uh, want to integrate with this for their fantasy sports decisions. Yep. So most baseball data is actually uh, made public. Uh, you can go to a website called Baseball Savant. You can actually go around the Major League Baseball data as well. There's APIs and libraries in both Python and R. Uh, there's a package called Pi Baseball. There's a package called Baseball R. Both of those will bring in these this pitch by pitch data to be able to do your own analysis. And this has led to a very healthy ecosystem called Sabermetrics. Sabermetrics is the public interface into baseball analysis. And I would like to say that we stand on the shoulders of these giants, these sabermetricians that came before us. Uh, there's a lot of great research that happens in the public sphere that then just gets adapted in the private club sphere. Um, it's also really interesting though as well, because sometimes the private models that we build on the club side do also leak out into the public sphere as well. Uh, one recent example of this has been stuff plus and pitching plus, which is a metric used to kind of quantify how effective or how good a pitch is by its uh, things like movement and speed and spin, uh, as opposed to the results of the, of the plate appearance. And we've had an internal version of this model for quite a few years now. However, maybe last year, maybe the year before, it got really viral in the public kind of sabermetric sphere. So it's really interesting to see kind of that dynamic, how the data created by the club can go to the public and how models created by the public kind of interface themselves with the club. There's plenty of public conferences out there specifically for baseball data, where both clubs and the public alike talk baseball and talk research. 
And it's really kind of pushed the game forward and how it's viewed through a data-driven lens. That's awesome. I imagine that, uh, you know, open models and open technologies help you out, uh, you know, more than proprietary ones. And with that in mind, what other, you know, you came from on-prem data warehousing, you were going to the cloud, you were probably evaluating cloud data warehouses as well as Lakehouse. Can you tell us about that and why you chose Lakehouse over other cloud data warehouses? Yeah, uh, definitely. So when we first started experiencing kind of this big data revolution in 2018, 2019, where we started adapting our technology from an on-prem stack to a warehouse, again, goes hand in hand to a lot of other experiences I've had with, and people in industry, that's just not baseball. You have this on-prem giant Oracle database, giant SQL Server database, and it doesn't scale, it's expensive, and now you got to do some stuff with the classical data warehousing tool in the cloud. Um, we thought that was the solution because the lake house really wasn't a modality that we had heard of or explored back in 2019. But we very quickly fell into the limitations of a warehouse of that two tier system. Um, that very, very expensive startup cost, that lack of flexibility with different data types, um, that lack of data transparency and what we wanted to be able to serve by kind of like this data mart. Um, and so we needed something different. We needed something that if we were investing the money into, we needed that money to be able to scale as well with all these new data sources. Uh, we need to be investing in streaming data, IOT data, the weather data, the pose tracking data, and all of these different data sources and videos and mapping everything together. Um, so the warehouses was not cutting it in terms of the cost benefit we were getting for the ability to scale. Uh, so naturally going to a lake house solution, being able to separate that compute and storage keeping all the storage for kind of the individual files and using the compute on the lake house site to be able to do those big data transformations became a natural fit for us. And I think that the data lake house is only growing in popularity over the last couple of years. And I expect it to continue increasing in popularity as well for a lot of that flexibility. My last kind of note on that too, being able to do analytics and machine learning where your data is is huge. It's enormous for like velocity and optimization and efficiency, right? My analysts don't necessarily have to be working on these disparate kind of computers. Their local R studio environments, their local Jupyter notebooks. We can have a more centralized workspace. And since that's all also where the data is, it's also quicker to be able to build these models on top of it. That's awesome. Yeah, so I think uh, I think we're going to uh, we have a lot of great questions. So there's a, a question about demos and uh, and uh, such. We're going to have a demo here in a little bit, and uh, also we're going to address more of your questions uh, by uh, the end of um, our talk. So I think Franco, uh, I would love to kind of get a sense of from your perspective. Um, from uh, the slow code environment from Databricks, uh, how do you view this uh, architecture? Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks, May. Uh, Alexander, that was an amazing uh, uh, talk. Uh, I seeing the questions and the commentary roll in as you were talking. Obviously, everyone is kind of amazed of all the data that you're using. Uh, and kind of you hit on a very few important issues that customers have with Databricks. It's you have to be a code first engineer to leverage the the the, the power and the simplicity behind the platform. And with Prophecy, actually, they, I consider Prophecy one of our best partners because they essentially put a, a graphical, simple to use interface on top of the lakeouts for data engineering. And they vastly simplify the data engineering tasks that these data, these analysts or these analyst engineers have to do in order to get their job done. And so they're not hardcore engineers. They are analysts that know the business, they know how things work, they know processes, they can conceptualize different things, but they, they're not code engineers, right? And Prophecy is great. It basically has this gem type of architecture where you find the gem you're looking for, very similar to other graphical nodes on a plane ETL uh, software, and you can ingest all types of data with it and then do all your transformations that you need. It also has built-in Git support for CI CD. So essentially it has this great integration with Databricks where we can pick up that repo and process it as, uh, as regularly scheduled jobs. And then Prophecy can be used to do all that development very simply for your analytics engineers. And <clears throat> the basically uh, Prophecy integrates the Delta Lake. You can process all of your data on the open Delta Lake. Um, and then it's available for data science and machine learning. Like Alexander advised, he ingests all of this data that comes from all over the place. 
Uh, and he takes that data, ingests it in, and then they get they offer that data up to their analytics engineers to develop data science and machine learning uh, algorithms. They can use MLflow to track all their models, and uh, you can even use uh, MLflow to do real-time serving. And at the same time, because Lakehouse is the best of both worlds, is the best of the data lake and the best of the warehouse, you can do all of these things on the same copy of the data. And so DBSQL or Databricks SQL is our warehouse offering. And that's basically the low latency, high concurrency warehouse serving layer to the lake house. And then all of this data that uh, has been curated from the bronze, silver, gold, or this can be called raw staging presentation layer. It's all the same concepts, just called a little bit differently. And now all of that data is available for enterprise reporting and BI. And this is essentially how customers can leverage the best of Databricks and Prophecy and how they integrate. Essentially, you have that graphical nodes on a plane that has how the visual editor. And that visual editor, the claim to fame for Prophecy, uh, one of the things I think is the best part is you can tr go transpile or flip between the visual editor and the code editor, which gives you this great ability to know what's going on behind the scenes. Alexander called it we don't like black box tools, tools that don't let you know what they're doing. This is what we call glass box tools. You can see exactly what's going on behind the scenes with the code, and that code is checked in. And then all lineage is tracked so that they, so anything that you need to do to find where that data was coming from or how it was transformed is all documented and available for exploration. And then even if you're coming from another system, so if you're migrating from on-prem, much, uh, much like how Alexander said the Rangers were doing, uh, we can help you rapidly accelerate the migration of your ETL workloads from your on-premise stack. So if you're using uh, on-premise on uh, you know, software to, to do all your processing, uh, Prophecy has great integrations or tooling to be able to migrate that code to Databricks Spark code so that you can execute it on Databricks. And essentially, Prophecy converts your workflows, so your DAG of operations of how your, your, your data is transformed, and Databricks is your new processing engine in the cloud. So essentially, you get the best of both worlds, and you get really, really cost-efficient and high-scale data processing, as well as giving uh, your users the ability to do value add tasks like data science and machine learning and take care of all of your SQL reporting and BI. And with that, I'd like to bring May back to talk to give us an excellent demo of Prophecy and Databricks. Thank you, Franco. So I love the glass box uh, analogy. This is exactly what Prophecy can do is uh, provide that layer of glass box for you all so that you can get started very quickly on the lake house architecture, uh, whether you have a Spark experience or not. So um, the usually what we this is like our bread and butter of our pipeline. So, you know, you, so what we call this is a gem uh, drawer. And uh, usually our pipeline starts with a source. And this particular source that we're seeing today, and let me just create a new one called orders. Sorry, folks, I don't have any baseball <laughs> data with me today. So uh, we're going to go with uh, a more traditional uh, data set. Uh, let's over here. So I do have a, a nice um, kind of a orders data here that has um, uh, that's a, a um, CSV and uh, it has a header right here. So we're going to parse this. Uh, we're just going to parse this data really quickly here with uh, um, that's on um, DBFS. So it just as Alexander had mentioned, this is a separation between compute and storage, so we can scale out very easily. And so that now that we have the orders data here, we can set some quick properties here by um, just infer the schema. And after it's inferring the schema, as you can see, we want the first row to be header. Um, the next step is to preview the data to make sure that we parse the data properly. And this is pretty clean. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and create the data set and save it. So this is uh, the first step of bringing some data in. And from here, it's almost like Lego pieces and you can just start building on top of it. So I have the customer's data already configured to save some time here. But um, so basically it's uh, the same exact thing that now that we have customers, we're going to enrich uh, the data sets together. Um, and basically the business question that we're trying to answer here is uh, per customer, how much, uh, how much money did they spend on orders? And also uh, how long have they been a customer? 
customer. So by doing that, we're going to need a join gem, right? We're going to join these data sets together. And then we're going to join them on customer ID. Okay. And from here, uh, if you're familiar with SQL, I can see my input data here. Uh, so input zero and input one. And I'm going to put a join condition. Uh, we're going to join on customer ID. And the uh, tab is also complete, really easy in one customer ID. So now we're doing a join here. And as far as expression goes, so I'm going to pick a few of these columns that I'm going to work with downstream. So these are the columns I'm going to work with after the join, coming out of the join. So this is where you can actually um, see whether you have any errors. If I have syntax errors, this will tell me. Um, and also make sure that if I have any unit testing, I can put it down here as well. So already I can't just run because um, I think uh, the Spark everybody might know is e lazily evaluated. So when I run it, I can kind of see what's going on here. And if I'm uh, joining on customer ID, this is definitely something that I don't want to see any nulls in. So these are a little observation um, that, you, uh, that it gives you as well. And so after the join, I'm going to do something really, really um, simple. <laughs> what I'm going to do is just clean some stuff up. Clean up, and the cleanup ultimately is a, a um, reformat um, gem, and this is pretty much what you would see, like uh, in a um, uh, basically in a select statement in SQL. And for this select, uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to do some basic transformation. For example, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna get rid of the first name and last name, and uh, I'm gonna do a full name and concatenate. Uh, and as you can see, a lot of these things are um, I mean, first name and the last name together. All right, so as you can see, there's an error. That's because I have two parentheses here. Uh, and for the account open date, I'm going to do a length. I'm going to do a um, date diff on this. Uh, so all the uh, Spark Databricks functions are supported here. Um, and for the diff, I'm going to use the current date and the difference between the current date and the open date. All right, so now I don't have any errors here. Everything looks really good. I'm gonna save it. Um, so um, just do a quick run here just to make sure things look pretty good. We have the full name, looks good. We have how long has it been since they opened the account, the total amount, uh, well, the amount, actually let's do a total amount and do an aggregation here um, just so that we can do some group by the, let's do the aggregation by order sum. So aggregate these things together. Um, so what I can do is for orders, um, I can do a count on the order. So aggregation is basically anything that requires a group by in SQL, if you're familiar with SQL. Um, so basically I'm going to count the group, uh, the order ID here and uh, customer ID. Uh, I mean, actually I'm gonna do a um, amount and sum the amounts together. And for these two, I'm just gonna bring them in as is. And then I'm going to group by uh, customer ID is because I wanna see the total based on the customer, right? So uh, there we go. And let's run this just to make sure the data looks good. And this is running basically Spark jobs on, on Databricks. And um, so things are looking pretty good. I have um, all the counts and again, I can't observe the statistics um, if needed. And so at the end, what I'm going to do is uh, um, write it out to a target. So usually the downstream data, you're gonna end up with a target um, and the target what I'm gonna uh, do is customers uh, um, orders. The target, it can be a lot of different things, uh, but for this uh, particular example, I'm going to write it out to a Delta table and the location that I'm going to write it to is make test. And let me do a customer order. Uh, this aggregation, maybe uh, next. And then I'm going to replace this if it exists. Oh, let me give it a name. Uh, aggregation. Just right here and save it. 
So now um, my pipeline is created. So one of the things that folks mentioned is uh, they really like the visibility into the code. So this is creating a lot of magic behind the scenes and we're not hiding any of this from you all. Um, so like a lot of these things, so, so every gem that you create, uh, create ultimately is pretty much just a data frame that you're going to work with right here. So everything, every one of them is a data frame and uh, the code is very easy to read. So you don't have to worry about having to parse other people's um, code and try to understand this. So all of this stuff is visual. And then at the end, I can go ahead and run it. And uh, once I run it, uh, this is just a spark jobs in progress. And, uh, and basically if I just go into, I'm just gonna run this really quick. This is what you will get. Uh, at the end is um, is what we just uh, run here. Um, so once uh, once this is run, what we usually do is uh, we can schedule this. So we um, integrate with the workflow with Databricks workflow and or any of your. This is super extendable. Uh, one of the things we want to make sure folks understand with the UI tools is that we want to make sure this is uh, super extendable, which means everything is committed to GitHub. Um, so every single project in Prophecy is um, is uh, is in a GitHub repo, and I can compare. This is my branch right here, and uh, I can go ahead and basically do um, do a merge and commit and merge it into main, and then release it to do a CI/CD. And so there's a whole lot, like a huge world behind everything else, uh, how we do um, how we manage everything in GitHub, and folks can integrate with whatever Git um, provider they may have, and also there's data lineage. There is monitoring. There's workflow. There's metadata. Um, so there's a there's a, a lot to go into, but we don't have enough time today. So I just wanna I just wanna mention those. Uh, and if you do have any interest in those, just let me know because um, I think it's really uh, important to understand that not only can we uh, can we um, uh, build these pipelines very easily, we can also share things very easily as well. So, you know, so we, uh, by sharing means that if somebody already created a pipeline and is already in um, the GitHub repo, like my repo, I can easily bring them in, right? So let me just put in a, a um, let's just um, do a test. I'm just going to create a new project here. So every project is, uh, let me just, sorry, let me do a different repo. Um, so dev, let me change this uh, maybe to Scala. And uh, so right now we can do Scala or we can do Python and I can do a continue. And right here is where I can integrate with my Git um, repo. And I can bring that Scala code uh, directly into, um, into uh, Prophecy. So right here, and I can do a complete. And every component that I make here can be shareable among my team members very easily. So when I open this project, all of a sudden I can see this amazing project that somebody had already built for me, which what they're doing is doing the bronze layer, they're doing the silver layer, and they're doing the gold layer. So for those of you that are familiar with the Laker House architecture, this is basically what's built. And I can drill down to each pipeline to see what's been built and modify on top of that, right? So these things are called subgraphs. I, I For any of the gems that I use very frequently, like for these, uh, like for example, of these two I work with very frequently, I can potentially just put them um, in a, let's see, in a subgraph. And once I put them in here, uh, they can be reused many, uh, many different times by, um, by a lot of the folks out there without having to understand what's in there. So I can build some uh, really complex and interesting stuff with this. So, so now you import this uh, and then you can create it like this is a master, uh, master fork. I can create my own branch and modify it and merge it back into main. Um, and uh, so this is all orchestrated and synced up with your GitHub. Everything is visible and uh, you, there's no, um, there's no proprietary of anything here so that, um, so that a team can collaborate very easily. Uh, in addition to that, I just want to give uh, have one minute, uh, and I just want to give give a quick preview of what's coming up with the, the new prophecy. Is uh, we do are going to start having support for SQL. 
So this environment is going to have various models and models is just really a list of um, uh, transformation that, that has a select statement out of all of this transformation. So instead of writing like hundreds and hundreds of pages of SQL code, you can just uh, use all the gems that we were talking about and start building out your pipeline, uh, visualize your lineage, try to schedule your jobs and, and link all of your jobs. Um, all of those are there for you. So this is um, this is a new thing that's coming out. We have not officially uh, announced it yet, but just want to give you all a preview, a sneak preview on that. All right. So that being said, I am going to, hopefully you all enjoy the demo. I'm going to go back here. Um, Ashley? Awesome, thank you so much, May, and fantastic demo. Um, and speaking of demos, uh, as we uh, round out our session here, we do wanna invite all of our attendees uh, to continue learning about Prophecy um, in the low-code offering that we do have for the Data Lake House uh, with Databricks. Uh, so please go ahead and book a one-on-one -on -one demo with Prophecy. Uh, the first 10 people that do book this demo right here, right now, you will win a Texas Rangers bobblehead, uh, again, courtesy of Alexander and the team over at the Texas Rangers. So uh, go ahead and book that demo. That link is in the chat. Um, and again, this is a great opportunity just to get a, a tailored uh, demo, um, again, uh, for your use case. Uh, and we'll sit you down with a technical expert. Um, and uh, go through that. So again, a great opportunity for you guys and, and take home more swag. Uh, and then just going over to this next slide here, uh, again, just uh, echoing again, uh, what May went over in her demo, the best way uh, to really experience the power of prophecy uh, for Databricks for the Data Lake House is to begin with the free trial. Uh, so that link is also here in the chat. Um, again, no strings attached. Um, just hop in and enjoy. We will be reaching out to you guys uh, just to see how we can make that trial experience even better for you guys. So um, would love for you guys to, to again, have a demo and, uh, and uh, start a free trial. So again, both links are in the chat and we'll also be sharing that uh, in follow-up emails here very shortly with the recording of this session. Uh, and with that, um, everyone, please join me in thanking um, our awesome speakers for today's session. This was truly incredible. Thank you, Alexander, Franco, and May. We're, we're so delighted to have you guys. And uh, thank you all, and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everybody.